What's up guys and welcome back to another episode here on the Architect Network. Today, let's talk BIM. Now, with everything going on in our industry with AI and game engines and, and other technologies disrupting what we do, I wanted to talk about good old BIM. So BIM is still a foundation of becoming an architect and is a key component in how we actually deliver buildings today. And right now the demand for BIM savvy architects is continuing to grow and actually far outweighs supply. It's really hard to find good BIM architects and by adding BIM to your skill set can be one of the best ways to increase your, va your value in the industry right now. So in this video I wanted to talk through what is BIM, how is it used in practice and the challenges we currently face in the industry. This video is also an introduction to our new ATN Revit Masterclass where I take you through the essentials of getting started with Revit and how I've been using it in practices like BIG over the last 10 years. You can check it out in the link below or go directly to architect.network and don't forget to check out our Discord where you can join a community of architects sharing knowledge around BIM, computation and other topics. Without any further ado, let's jump into it. As always, if you like this video, give it a like and a subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram for upcoming videos, podcasts, and courses. Okay, so the first things first, let's define what BIM is, but I'm gonna describe it in a, in a couple different ways. So let's start off with the basics. What is BIM? Well, BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. But what does this actually mean? Well, BIM is really just a 3D model. And the moment it, it kind of becomes a BIM model is when the geometry itself is not just a meaningless shape, but it's packed full of data and information inside it. So, you know, this column that I'm hovering over here, uh, it is not just a, a cube. It actually has information inside it and now um what i'm going to do is jump into uh rhino and revit to just explain that a little bit more what is the difference between what i call modeling and modeling environment versus a bim model or a bim environment okay so in rhino if i want to make a wall essentially i have to make a box so i use the box command and i can you know give it some dimensions let's say it's 600 mil by six meters by, you know, three meters high, right? This is my my box. Now I can put that on this layer and I've applied a concrete texture to it, right? So I can give it some materiality. But outside of that, uh, there's not really much more information. I mean, it's just a dumb box wrapped in a texture. The only other thing is I can put it on a layer that says wall and so now uh, it's kind of, you know, I know that everything on this layer is a wall. I can give it a name called WA01. Uh, but outside of that, there's no real information this geometry has inside of it. Like Rhino does not know that this is a wall. There is nothing special about uh, the geometry. It is just a box that's wrapped in a texture and I can give it a very, very base level amount of information. Now, if we jump over to Revit and look at that same process, let's see the difference between the two. Now that I'm over in Revit, let's build a wall. First thing is, instead of building a box, there is actually a wall component. So as I draw the wall, it's, it's first of all really simple. I'm just drawing a line and then Revit does the, wet, does the rest. If I select the object, it is in a category called wall. It knows that it is a wall. It's also got different types of walls based on uh, either the dimensions or build up or any other kind of stuff. So there's a subtype of different types of walls, right? And then also when I have this thing selected, look at all the information that's embedded inside it, right? I can, you know, see how high the wall is. I can see length, area, volume, I can also input stuff like the mark could be my WA1 or, or whatever. Um, there's a whole bunch of information. I can see what level it goes from. Uh, there's tons of information and there's even more information inside the type of that wall. I can actually see the buildup of the wall. I can create more complicated walls like, uh, you know, structure, insulation, finish. Uh, you can also see like there's, there's statistics inside here. Uh, if I go back, 
Uh, you can also see more complicated information like uh, analytical properties, materials and finishes, a bunch of more parameters where I could put the cost per square meter, the a URL of a website of uh, maybe a particular uh, mass timber product that I'm using or, or a manufacturer that I'm using, like all of this stuff can be embedded in this, uh, in this piece of geometry. And this is the difference between a modeling environment and a, and a BIM environment, right? This piece of geometry is packed with all this information inside of it. The other thing that's unique in this BIM environment is not only is the information embedded in the geometry and you can access it, but you can actually control the, the geometry through the information. So here, this curtain panel uh, that I have on my screen is controlled by these uh, information. If I update it, all of the families uh, that I have populated my model with update at the same time. So I can also control the geometry based on the information. And so here you see, these are all the same types of family. This is all the same curtain wall family that I can also use that information to control the geometry. So it's a two way street. And this goes through for all elements in Revit. A column has specific column parameters. Uh, a floors have, have their buildups and their own parameters. Every single element in Revit, a curtain wall has parameters for how it's divided into panels. Even the mullions inside the curtain panels have information inside them that control them and give you information on how to build it. Uh, even simple chairs, you'll have the manufacturer, maybe even the specific product, especially if it's like furniture, it's bought from a specific person in a specific company, you can embed all of that information into your BIM model. So that covers the pure definition of what is BIM, but there's another way to describe it. It is a completely different approach to how we have in the past uh, developed projects. So beforehand, we had this era where we had a 3D model and a 2D, 2D model, like uh, a Rhino and a AutoCAD, right? And you, you updated one and then you went back to the other, you updated the plans, then you had to come back to 3D and update the 3D. And there was this back and forth and it was kind of silly because we were spending time developing essentially two models in two different formats at the same time. So BIM is a completely different approach where it's a more holistic approach where you build a 3D model and you extract from it all of the stuff that we need. So uh, we simply slice the model to create plans and drawings, elevations, sections, all this kind of thing. If we want to quantify things, we, t we just simply calculate all of these things from a model. We can collaborate in the model, we can visualize. And so it's really extracting out all of the stuff that we need. And this has also got a slightly different approach, uh, a mentality when you're actually working in a BIM environment, because often I find people are working in a 2D view, for example, here you've got a 2D view, I have my floor selected, uh, people get into the approach that if I delete that, it's just deleted from that view because they, they're kind of in that AutoCAD uh, mentality. But actually keep in mind that you have that floor selected in 3D. It's also in your elevations. And even when you select a line in a schedule, you're still selecting a 3D thing. So it is a switcher mentality that you're not only working in 2D, you're working in 3D simultaneously. And this information can be uh, controlled in many different formats. So from that 3D model, we're extracting our drawings. All of these drawings are simply slices and, and maybe some drawing on top of our model. You can also enrich your drawings with things like this, like axos of the model. And this is all just put onto views of our 3D model that are put onto sheets and annotated on top of. And so we can create our plans, our sections. We can even create stuff like this, like call outs of specific 3D elements and schedule how many uh, panels we have, for example. These are not line by line drawings. These are all drawings directly from a 3D model. And so if anything changes here, all my drawings update. So documentation is one of the main things that uh, you know, we, we extract from the model. The other thing is quantities. Of course, we can now, with if all the elements are modeled in our 3D environment, we can simply schedule the, how many panels we have in our, in our model. We can see uh, the surface area of glass. We can see the width, the height, all of the things that we might need to actually go quantify and build it. The other key element and, uh, of this overall approach is also the collaborative aspect. So 
you know, in Rhino and, and AutoCAD, only one person can work in that file. Someone has to close it for someone else to work on. But in Revit and BIM environment, multiple people can work on the same model at the same time. And so this is a key aspect of the collaboration side of BIM. And also what makes it very powerful is everyone is accessing the model at the same time and changing their respective parts of the project, which makes working together and collaborating and communicating so much better than the kind of 2D era. This also expands not only within your own firm, but within firms outside of yours. So you can collaborate with uh, your your structural engineer, your uh, facade consultant, your M&E consultant, and all these different people, even the contractor, right? So this collaboration aspect is not only internally, you might have a team of 10 of people working on your product, but then externally, you've then got people, um, a team of 10 in the structural, uh, the structural engineers, the, the facade guys and all that kind of stuff. So you can collaborate on a much wider basis and uh, coordinate and communicate in a much better way. Uh, and then, of course, we can also use this model because it has so much detail and information inside it. We can use that model uh, with real-time rendering platforms such as Twinmotion and Enscape, uh, where you can actually go around and view and experience the model. So here you can see in Enscape, I'm flying around. I'm actually looking at the, the BIM model I've been using with, you know, populating it with Enscape assets and things like that. So I can visualize it as you would do from Rhino. But it also comes with some cool BIM specific things. So I can actually in Enscape click on objects and see all that information. So it can be used as a way to communicate uh, some of the BIM aspects of the model. Uh, it does also come with some, again, BIM specific features where you can coordinate on it. You can you can create issues which are little tags and you can say, hey, this column is uh, the wrong size and there is an issue with it. And you can describe someone, I need you to move this and change the dimensions and you can create uh, issues. So this is one of the way that you can actually use real-time rendering to coordinate with BIM, which is also a super powerful, uh, powerful aspect of real-time rendering combined with BIM. And so this is the completely different approach from the 2D era. In this 3D era, you simply have a 3D model and we are extracting all of the stuff that we need to actually build or deliver that building. And so this era is kind of the 3D era of BIM. Before we had the 2D, you could call it 2D BIM or it is just called 2D BIM. And this is where you're using a 3D model to extract your drawings, schedules, a communication, visualization, and all that kind of stuff. And this is called a different dimensions of BIM. And there are, other, are further dimensions of BIM. So not only are you creating a 3D model just to produce drawings and all that kind of stuff, but the other kind of dimensions of BIM, we got 4D BIM. That's where you start to uh, model and sequence out the construction sequence. So uh, this part goes on first and this part goes on next and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 5D BIM is when you detail in a detailed way, add costing information. These can usually be code, specific codes and elements that plug into much more advanced costing software. Facilities management, so the people that use the building afterwards can use the BIM model in some way and also add their information to the model. 7D BIM is when you have sustainable sustainability stuff embedded in the, in the model. So that could be uh, carbon and carbon consumption, LCA, uh, and also the analytic side of how your building performs. And then you've got 8D BIM, which is when you start to add health and safety and all these other kind of things. So I'm not going to delve into these too much, but just to put them out there, there are various different versions, like dimensions of BIM, and they are defined. So if you ever hear, hear everyone talking about 4D BIM, 5D BIM, this is what they're talking about. One of the things I wanted to touch on is how BIM is actually used in practice and, and what is the kind of basic ways that most practices are using BIM. And so uh, BIM is mostly used in practice today as a way to streamline the design process, particularly from the early design stages to that documentation stages, as we kind of talked about with the 3D BIM. Um, we have these two worlds, right, where we design in one platform in, in Rhino because it's it's good, it's flexible, allows us to iterate very quickly in those early stages. And then we transition over to Revit that allows us to document uh, and streamline our documentation process. And we use each one for what it's best at. 
Uh, this is particularly, like to illustrate this process of evolving from 2D to 3D BIM, this table basically goes through uh, moving from one design stage, so this is the American design stages, from SD to DD. Um, and as you kind of start the next phase of the project, in theory, the more time you work on the project, the more it's going to develop. But at the same time, you also need to be developing uh, your your deliverables, right? You've got to create plans, elevation sections, all this kind of thing, because that's the thing you have to deliver at 50% and, and, and uh, at the end of the stage. Now, in a perfect world, this is might how it look, but if you spent more than five minutes in practice, you will know that it doesn't look like this at all. It's much more like this, right? You come in, you start your stage, you get off to a good start, and then you get some critical information from the engineers, which changes a few things. Then you push really hard, and you have a review with one of the directors, and the design completely changes direction. And there's this, you know, this is the real world of products. It's very up and down. And in the 2D era of BIM, there was always this moment where it's like, okay, there's this pens down moment. Now we have to stop any kind of designing and, and iterating, and we've got to actually produce the drawings. And we had to go and and uh, draw the plans again because they've changed. All the columns are in different locations. So you almost had to draw every drawing from scratch uh, because it wasn't necessarily linked to a 3D model. So the first kind of implementation of BIM in practice is to just simply streamline this process. With a BIM model, as you can see from that 3D BIM era, uh, you ha if you have a 3D model and you have all your views and plans and drawings set up, if you change uh, the geometry of that building, it doesn't affect you as much because all of the views will just update because they're just looking at your 3D model. Um, so that is the simple uh, goal of BIM at the beginning is just to streamline your documentation process. And this feeds back into the design process because now you free up designers to spend less time drawing plans line by line uh, and they're able to kind of spend more time where they make the most amount of impact, which is actually in creative problem solving and thinking. So this is the simple goal of BIM uh, being used in practice. And that's regardless of whether you're using it uh, to collaborate internally and externally. So all of these drawings, you know, we can, we can automate this process um, by simply setting workflows up to create our drawings and updating models and things like that is not so much of a problem because these are all just referring back to our 3D model. Of course, the other way that people that we used BIM in practice is it's a much more efficient way to collaborate and coordinate either internally or externally. So what I mean by that is that even sometimes a project comes in, no one is making us use BIM, like the client doesn't necessarily want a BIM model as a deliverable. We would still use BIM as a way to streamline our process, as I've just talked about, and a much more uh, streamlined way for us to collaborate so that everyone is working on the same thing at the same time. We can coordinate uh, between ourselves uh, within different aspects and areas of the building. But we can also do this on a uh, much bigger way of collaborating externally with other consultants and other disciplines. So we can also collaborate in the same model with uh, the engineers or the facade consultants, the M&E consultants, and, and all these other kind of people. And so therefore, we can also create a much more coordinated uh, a set of documentation drawings and models. So in the 2D era, we're able to resolve, identify and resolve a lot of issues that we may not have caught until much later stages causing later problems in the 2D era of BIM and deliverables. And so in, in simple, the three ways that BIM is being used in practice is one as part of the design process, and that's largely to do with the second thing of streamlining our documentation process, if we can streamline the production of drawings and documentation, that feeds back into the design process, um, which allows designers to spend more time designing. And also the collaboration and coordination, we can deliver a much more coordinated model, either internally as well as externally, which means that the drawings that we're delivering are potentially of much better quality and we we try and uh, reduce the amount of issues that we'll face 
in the future by looking and coordinating this on a 3D level rather than a 2D level. So that is the very basic way that I see BIM being actually being used in architecture practice today. Let's also touch on the most used BIM software that's currently in the industry. Now you can check out a video that I did on YouTube before, which kind of sums up all of the tools and technologies we have available to us that was from, from last year, but it's still relevant today. This is more BIM focus. So specifically in the world of BIM, what are the most used softwares? Without a doubt, Revit is the most industry uh, used uh, BIM platform that we have at the moment. We then also have uh, Archicad, which is a second. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a close second because it's probably not, it's not as good as uh, at the collaboration side. And that is a big reason why it wasn't as widely adopted. But you do get some pretty uh, people that use Archicad are very passionate about how good it is. And it does have a lot of pros. You've then got Vectorworks, which is an earlier BIM platform. I almost see it as like a a 2D era uh, slash 3D era. Uh, I see Vectorworks used a lot in maybe smaller practices or particularly like, uh, you know, designing homes and, and things like that, that kind of scale. I see a lot of people using Vectorworks. And then I also put in the new kid on the block, which is Blender BIM. Blender is like an open source uh, modeling platform. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, modeling platform but it also some people are releasing some kind of bim add-ons to it to give it the functionality of bim uh, i wouldn't say it's kind of competing with the others yet but i just put it in there because you might want to keep an eye on it for the future could potentially be the next thing who knows in terms of computation what computational tools do we have at our, at our fingertips in the world of bim well dynamo of course is the you know, computational plugin for Revit. It is the grasshopper for Revit. And for years, that is what's uh, what we've used to utilize computation in Revit. However, as of a few years ago, we now have Rhino Inside, which is where you can open up Rhino and Grasshopper and use it to create Revit geometry, uh, you know, bring geometry from Rhino to Revit and vice versa. And so now we have a singular computational tool of Grasshopper that can be used in uh, Rhino and Revit. And of course, we will be following this course up with a Rhino Inside course, so stay tuned for that. And then of course, you've got you know your more coding-based computational tools. Uh, I've put Python here because that's probably the most used, uh, the, the most popular coding language that is used in Revit, for example. And there's even great plugins that allow you to get under the hood a little bit called PyRevit and things like that that are really powerful for, in terms of computation. So those, I would say, are the main BIM computational tools. You can also turn your Rhino model into BIM with some specific plugins. There's Visual Arc, which is a plugin that tries to or that brings BIM elements into Rhino, uh, particularly on drawing production and also more kind of parametric uh, elements and blocks. I've not used it that much myself, but i am always been interested in trying to implement it a bit more. Uh, but it's definitely one interesting one to check out. The other one is a Grasshopper plugin called Elefront, which I do have a fair bit of experience using where you can actually embed information in geometry and it's particularly powerful for kind of fabrication level uh, information uh, where you can utilize Rhino's, mod the power of Rhino modeling and grasshopper computation to create very complex BIM models. Finally, I wanted to touch on and talk about the promise of BIM versus the reality. Now, whenever you have a new technology or a new approach that is affecting and has to be adopted on an industry-wide scale, particularly like the AEC industry, it is obviously going to take time before it is fully adopted and fully embraced by all disciplines. And this is one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why we're in an era where we've not necessarily reached the true promise of BIM uh, because of the certain realities of how we work in practice. Now, for sure, BIM has affected uh, and has improved and streamlined our design process. Uh, but at the same time, we, we still have the different worlds that we work in for different things. We have, you know, again, Rhino for where we design, Revit for where we document, and this whole suite of other things that go around it. Um, and part of the reason why we have all these separate 
tools and why why the tools are not quite delivering what we need is, for example, some of the software that we use, for example, Revit is over 20 years old at this point. Uh, Autodesk have, have kind of stopped almost developing it at pace. Uh, the base code is still almost 20 years old. And for that reason, it's it's not really kept up with the needs of the industry. And that's a big reason why we work in separate worlds and we don't have this one fixed world or platform that we design, document, document and uh, deliver our buildings. But that is on the horizon. So you look at the suite that we have, we, we you know, this is a very simplified version of the tools that we use in practice. We design in Rhino, we document in Revit, we use Grasshopper for computation, and uh, we can visualize things in, in real-time rendering like Enscape or Twinmotion or something like that. Um, but the interesting thing, I think we're in an era where these are starting to conjoin. We have plugins that allow us to talk from one another, like Rhino inside. But then we will, I think, see in the very near future like game engines having a big effect. Like, will we see an environment that stitches all of these things together in a game engine-like environment? I've put Unreal here because I think that's a really interesting one, but you've also got things like Omniverse or maybe even Unity that could be could be uh, the future of, of to deliver the promise of BIM. You've also got AI now coming. Will AI have a component in the future of uh, the next version of BIM so we can use AI to automate even more of the things that we don't want need to do so that we can spend more time uh, designing and making an impact. And also where we start to see BIM go into the cloud a bit more. So we start to collaborate a bit like uh, how we now have moved from Word, which was a, a single file that we use on a computer to Google Docs where everyone is collaborating. They can access the model at any time and uh, from anywhere. I really think this will be the future of delivering the true promise of BIM is the next iteration of BIM where all of these things are tied together, possibly driven by game engines, influenced by AI and other kind of cloud-based uh, platforms. So one of the reasons why we're not seeing the true BIM is because the true promise of BIM is because of the tools that we currently have within the industry. The other thing is the realities of collaboration and coordination. Now, it's amazing, yeah, if everyone's working out of Revit and is, is uh, happy to collaborate uh, on projects. Uh, but this isn't always the case. For example, like in this diagram, uh, let's say the architect is fully in BIM, but the consultant may actually not be in, in the world of BIM. They may be, still be in the 2D era, and therefore they collaborate with you by sending drawings and AutoCAD drawings. And so then you have to pipe that into your 3D model. Uh, it can be done, but it just means that you're not collaborating really at the level that you that you could be. Also, we also get uh, scenarios where like a, another consultant here in this diagram is like an engineer where they are using a BIM model, but they see it really just as a deliverable. And therefore, they just have like a, a BIM person in the corner that, that creates the BIM model for them. But the actual engineers don't really spend time in the model and they communicate to you via PDF or, or some other like 2D form. So again, you're not really utilizing the true promise of collaborating in BIM. And that's also partly to do with how the industry is fragmented uh, and you know different disciplines work in different ways. And then of course, there, there's also like just the sy systematic ways that we actually build things, right? We are architects, uh, we don't actually build things, contractors build things, right? So uh, sometimes you do get architects over delivering BIM, like we don't need to uh, model nuts and bolts because we don't really get into that level of detail, but the contractor will. So there's also an element of uh, delivering BIM for the right reasons. Uh, what is the information that we need to deliver that for the next person to pick up? Uh, because very much in the industry, you, you get things like this, like the, the architect creates a BIM model and they, they may hand it over to an exec, executive architect that rebuilds it and reinterprets it. And the contractor then builds their own model and then the subcontractor builds their own model. So uh, we had this problem in the 2D era and to some degree, you also get it in the 3D era. Um, this kind of issue of like, repeating or redrawing the same things through dis different disciplines. Um, in, a, in a dream world, maybe we'll see digital fabrication 
allow us uh, like allow us to realize the true promise of BIM where you as a designer can design in this BIM environment, you can create this BIM model, and then that model can be used to collaborate and coordinate and go directly into the act of making either through uh, digital fabrication like CNC, 3D printing maybe in the future. It could be more digital in that like your model may just be overlaid in a 3D uh, in a real world environment for, via augmented reality or something like that. But the true promise of BIM may come when we start to connect these things in a fully digital design process from design to documentation to fabrication. Uh, but at the moment, our industry is incredibly fragmented. That being said, there are lots of uh, stories or proof that the true promise of BIM is out there and it is being realized. This is one uh, that I actually um, I actually worked on this product. This was I was working for Front. This is Zaha's Morpheus Hotel, and we at Front were uh, asked to deliver a create a BIM model and the fabrication information for all the of the cladding of this exoskeleton. And so the only way that we made this building become a reality is by using BIM, and we were able to model uh, the system behind the cladding. Obviously, this is a completely freeform building. No one panel is the same. Everything is unique. And so we use the, we harness the power of computation and BIM to model every single element and then create the fabrication drawings from this element. And because of that, the, the uh, complexity of the building was absorbed by the BIM model. And when it came to construction, uh, we had very little requests for change orders, very little RFIs, because so many of the conditions have been thought through in the digital world, so that when it came to building in the real world, it was a lot more uh, of a seamless process. And a building this complicated could probably only be built uh, because we harnessed the power of BIM. Also, there, there's also stories of, of uh, stock texts like Frank Gehry, um, Contrary to what you might think uh, of of Gary's buildings, which are obviously highly complex in geometry and extravagant, he's he's kind of well known for actually always delivering buildings on time and on budget. Of course, this is not always the case, but it's it's uh, the vast majority. Uh, I've been reading he they deliver on time and on budget, and this is largely due to their very digital design process. Uh, Gary and partners were, were very early in adopting BIM. Uh, they were one of the first people to adopt Rhino, and uh, they also adopted BIM uh, software from the aerospace industry, um, which allowed them to essentially uh, model every single element of their building so they can resolve issues in 3D. So when it comes to building in, in reality, they were able to uh, you know negate any issues. And then also what's interesting from a contractual perspective, they actually sit themselves directly under the client and even the contractor sits underneath uh, the architect. Therefore, that also, allow, that also enables them to kind of bypass the typical issues of our industry being kind of very fragmented. So that was quite of a, an interesting example of a stock tech using BIM to uh, deliver the true promise of BIM. And then finally, I have also spent a lot of time working at Big, where firsthand I've seen how much we can streamline our own design process, whether it's simply internally, but also externally. And many of the products that you see online and, and the renders of, of these image, of these projects often have a BIM model. As I said, uh, we use it in many different ways. It could just be internally to streamline our documentation process or it's externally because the thing is a large and complicated product that is going into construction. And a a big part of why BIG has built so much in such a space, short space of time is because of the adoption uh, of BIM um, to streamline that process from design to documentation to built form. And so behind every one of these products that you see at BIG, there is always a BIM model being used in some way. And that's exactly what our ATN Rabbit Masterclass is all about. We'll be going through everything you need to know to get up to speed in Revit, whether you're a single practitioner or working in a large practice. Our course is made up of six modules that will go through all of the basics of modeling, 
views and schedules, annotation, setting up drawing sheets, collaboration, and even creating your own families. And at the end of this course, we'll have your first product in Revit, and we'll go through setting all of that up and also creating your very first drawing set and all of the standards and families that we create along the way. So you can check it out right now in the link below this video or go to architect.network on our website and access it for just $39.99 and get started learning Revit today.